Welcome to this video on the top 10 vampires of the Bali. Well, this is going to be an interesting little ride. There is so much contradictory information about the Bali that their true origins are likely to never actually be cleared up. And you know, I kind of like it that way. The Bali began their existence way back in 2nd edition as a bunch of NPCs whose defining characteristics was that they liked to hail Satan and they wanted to lower your property values by summoning demons to your neighborhood. The revised and dark age Bali still worshipped demons, but this time half wanted to bring on the end times and do that whole rain in hell thing, while the other half wanted the demons to stay right where they were until called upon, resulting in a kind of in-clan cold civil war between Bali. The Bali are occasionally called a clan, and that's one of those speculation lore tidbits that has never been answered definitively, and I kind of hope never is. Who created the Bali? There are a varying number of 4th generation Bali Methuselahs between 2nd edition and revised, and theories have run rampant for years as to which naughty antediluvian is responsible, ranging from Hakim, to Cappadocius, to Salat, to Arakel, and even to Zemitsi. But without further ado, here are the top 10 vampires of the Bali. Number 10, Shaitan. Let's start with a nice second edition Bali, because second edition beats everything else. The vampire Shaitan was born in 4520 BC, oddly specific, but okay, in the second city. He was a beautiful youth and became a favorite of the antediluvian who called himself Asher. Hmm, that's interesting. Now which antediluvian is believed to have been named Asher? Cappadocius? Uh-oh! Shaitan was embraced in 4500 BC as Asher's second child. It's interesting, at least to me, to note that Asher was the name of the tutelary deity of the Assyrians and also the name of their first capital city. Not content to remain at his sire's side, Shaitan left the second city and journeyed east. There, Shaitan consorted with the children of Lilith. Now, the children of Lilith refers to a number of mortals and monsters in the world of darkness including the mages of the Bahari, the worm-tainted Fomorians, the Gangrel, Toreador, and Malkavian antediluvians respectively, and the mysterious Nephilim, who may or may not have been children of Lilith and Lucifer, as in the leader and most powerful of heaven's fallen angels. When Shaitan returned to the second city, he taught his fellow vampires the new philosophies and disciplines he learned in the east, all except for the Gangrel whom he loathed for whatever reason. The Gangrel responded by publicly denouncing Shaitan for consorting with the children of Lilith in violation of Cain's commandments. Despite Asher's attempts to save his favorite child, Shaitan and his followers were banished from the second city. Shaitan returned to the east and built his own city around the area of Kalat Shergat in Iraq. The vampire was approached by a demon calling itself Baal, who was willing to bestow new powers on Shaitan in exchange for eternal loyalty. Shaitan, hungry for revenge, agreed to the demon's bargain. At Baal's instruction, Shaitan expanded his nation, enslaving conquered tribes and sacrificing humans for the glory of Baal. As Shaitan's empire grew, the second city fell to internal strife. By the time the Ashurians, Asamites, and Bruja journeyed east looking for a new home, Baal had long since departed. Shaitan had taken to calling himself and his brood, Bali, in his master's honor though they were few in number because Shaitan had taken to embracing progeny simply to sacrifice them to his patron. The Ashurians, Asamites, and Bruja attacked and overthrew the Bali easily, too easily in fact, and conquered Kalat Shergat for their own. Of course, nothing is ever that easy in the world of darkness. Baal had warned Shaitan about the coming Cainites, and Shaitan had left a few specially prepared childer to die in place of himself and his chosen. The Bali then scattered to the four corners of the earth, Shaitan and his thirteen progeny and their broods, each acting independently of the others so that they might one day take revenge against their Cainite cousin. But Kalat Shergat had taught them a sharp lesson about the perils of ruling openly. Instead, the Bali took the names of the people's gods for their own and hid their moves to gain power. Shaitan himself journeyed far away, across the ocean long before such journeys were even considered, to the Americas. By 1200 BC, Shaitan was there, guiding the Olmecs, then the Toltecs, then the Mayans, and finally the Aztecs to their glory and their depravity, 
acting through an intricate web of retainers and pawns, choosing winners and losers from the shadows. Other kindred occasionally found their way into Shaitan's nest, woefully ignorant of the land's true master. Most of these fools he sent to final death. The rest he bent to his service. Despite the occasional upheavals caused by the Spaniards, the French, the Americans, and the Sabat, Shaitan, or as the Aztecs called him, Huitzilopochtli, the god of war, the sun, and human sacrifice, has ruled Mexico for nearly 3,000 years uninterrupted. Shaitan would have liked to have acquired the Toreador Methuselah Helena for his retinue, but she fled north in such a hurry that he didn't have time to properly persuade her. Helena's child, however, Melinda Galbraith, made an acceptable substitute. Shaitan ensured her rise to the regency of the Sabbat, and Melinda Galbraith has remained grateful for his counsel and support. As for Shaitan Huitzilopochtli's contemporary activities, I would have to talk about the World of Darkness' most ridiculously overpowered character, Samuel Height, and he deserves his own video. So, I'll leave that part of the first Shaitan story for another time. Number 9. Nurgle In a slightly alternate telling of the origins of the Bali, there was not one child of Asher who fell under the influence of unholy powers, but three. The first was Nurgle. Nurgle was a part of an ancient tribe that worshipped beings that existed before the creation of the world and were cast down within the earth when the first light exploded across the heavens. These beings they knew as the Children of Night and were worshipped by Nurgle's first tribe, who had learned some of their true names. The first tribe heard the whispers of the children and the power that could be theirs, if only they would feed the children with atrocities, sacrificing victims in horrific ways and casting their remains into a well of sacrifice. One night, a child of Cain came among the first tribe and paid them in their own coin, in a single night full of torture and slaughter. The Cainite tossed the ragged survivors into their own well of sacrifice to join the rotting putrid corpses. On a whim, the vampire opened his arm and tossed some of his blood into the well. Why he did this, no one knows, but the three survivors of the massacre found his vitae and saved themselves. The next night, Nurgle, along with his brethren, emerged from the well of sacrifice, covered in gore and filth from hundreds, or even thousands, and abandoned by not only his patron deity, but his sire. This, however, did not trouble Nurgle, for he believed he had been reborn as a god in his own right. Nurgle made his nest in the city of Mashkan Shapir between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. Nurgle infiltrated the ranks of other Canaanites at first, beguiling them with flattery and sophistry, and then learning their secrets and adding them to his own cult. Meanwhile, Mashkan Shapir became the heart of his empire. In Nurgle's temple, he continued his practice of human sacrifice and afflicted his followers with grisly plagues. He also bred a line of ghouls to serve as his priests and occasional assassins, the Dahabi, known for being utterly without mercy or morals when it came to their master's will. Nurgle gave rise to some of the more grisly tales of his Mesopotamian namesake, the god of war, pestilence, and the underworld. Nurgle was no monster by accident. His city was not chosen for its pleasant location. Nurgle knew that one of the children of night dwelt beneath his city, or at least he believed so. It had whispered to him in his dreams, and he in turn gave it a name of power, Namtaru, the spreader of plagues. Nurgle wished to free Namtaru, but could not locate his body, no matter how much of the city he excavated. Eventually, Nurgle determined that the only solution to awaken Namtaru fully would be to sacrifice his own, all of Mashkan Shapir in a single stroke so that Namtaru would in turn rise and make him the god he believed himself to be. The other children of Cain learned of Nurgle's ambition after he was betrayed by his own Dahabi ghouls who feared that Namtaru's rise would mean their own destruction. The Cainites marched to war against him and Mashkan Shapir. The diseased and dying people of the city offered little resistance to their own deaths. Some even welcomed the peace of the sword. When Mashkan Shapir was bright with the pyres of burning corpses, the Cainites turned their attention to Nurgle's temple. His power prevented them from entering the temple and confronting the plague lord in person. So, members of Clan La Sombra, who worshipped the goddess Erish Kigal, the queen of night and the underworld, summoned a flood of liquid shadow that broke through Nurgle's wards 
and washed away the Bali Methuselah and nearly all of his followers in the temple. Or so the Cainites thought. Every player in Nurgle's drama had performed their role to perfection. Nurgle had dominated his Dahabi ghouls beforehand to believe that their betrayal was sincere, and then quietly broke the conditioning and dispatched them among the other Bali to act as his eyes and ears. The other Cainites believed him to be destroyed, which gave him the benefits of time and anonymity. In the grand scheme of things, the loss of one city was nothing compared to the prize to be won, the resurrection of a true god of darkness. Nurgle spent centuries in hiding, laying the groundwork for his eventual return. He discovered Namtaru's true resting place, north of Galilee, and built a city over his sleeping master, a place that would become infamous in the centuries to come, Chorazin, a veritable palace of bone and shadows. In 2000 BC, Nurgle returned to the world, calling himself Shaitan. Through charisma, treachery, and raw power, he rallied most of the Bali to his banner, claiming to be the progenitor of all the bloodline. Those who rejected or denied Nurgle met final death as a mysterious plague turned their vitae to dust within their own bodies. But as in Mosk and Shapir, Nurgle's new flock were meant to be sacrificial, pawns to keep his enemies at bay while he completed the true work of raising Namtaru. After centuries of work and excavations, Nurgle discovered Namtaru's gigantic, withered corpse. And at this point, Nurgle enacted the second portion of his plan. He moved Namtaru from Chorazin to the island of Gnosis in Crete, and a labyrinth his followers had constructed under Thera, crafted specifically to facilitate Namtaru's awakening. Chorazin would serve as an excellent decoy, planned within plans, fail-safes and fallbacks. In the middle of the second millennium BC, Namtaru stirred from his slumber, and in stirring from this slumber, affected the world in a nearly disastrous way. The water surrounding Gnosis turned to Vitae. A veil of darkness spread across the island, allowing vampires to walk beneath the sky at any time. The child of night, the spreader of plagues, very consciousness twisted nature to fit its unspeakable nightmares. In a rare show of unity and desperation, the children of Cain once again united to stop Nurgle's attempt to summon Namtaru. However, as with his temple centuries before, they could not penetrate the island. So, the blood magicians of the clans enacted a ritual of their own, a working of thaumaturgy the likes of which has never been seen since. They caused Mount Thera to erupt. And not just any eruption, it was an ultraplenian eruption. Now, pardon me while I take a brief interruption from this lore to impress upon you the severity of what these ancient vampires did to stop a demon from walking the earth again. The Thera eruption was approximately the equivalent of a 600 megaton bomb going off. To put that in further perspective, the atomic bomb dropped on Hiroshima was only 13 kilotons. So it takes about a thousand kilotons to get a megaton. So the Thera explosion was a little over 46,000 times as powerful as an atomic bomb. Suck on that technocracy and your little pansy spirit nukes. The Cainites primed this volcano to explode and then dropped said volcano right on Nurgle's face. Needless to say, it was super effective. Nurgle's labyrinth collapsed just as he was about to raise Namtaru, and as for the spreader of plagues, he burrowed deep into the earth to slumber once again. This was the end of Nurgle, but not his legacy. Every so often, a Bali rises to prominence calling themselves Shaitan, hoping to capitalize on the fearsome reputation of Nurgle. But more troubling is that Nurgle dispersed many lesser names of the Children of Night, names by which they could be partially summoned and bargained with for power, making Nurgle, inadvertently, the true father of infernalism and the path of evil revelations, at least among vampires. But most troubling of all, somehow, the 36 lesser names of Namtaru took on a life of their own, each becoming a powerful aspect of Namtaru and a demon lord in their own right. These kings of plague are known in the modern nights as the Dakani. Number 8. Moloch. Moloch was the second Bali to emerge from the Well of Sacrifice. Moloch had a very different philosophy from his brother Nurgle. Where Nurgle took followers from wherever he could, regardless of lineage, mortal or canite, Moloch preferred to embrace from the bloodlines that originated from the first tribe. But perhaps more importantly, 
Moloch had absolutely no interest in awaking Namtaru or any of the other children of the night. Nurgle looked on the children and saw gods. Moloch looked on the children and saw tools. Exceptionally powerful and dangerous tools, but tools nonetheless. As such, Moloch wanted to keep the secret names of the children hidden from mortals, so that their power could only be for him and his brood. The Dahabi ghouls, in fear for their lives, ran to Moloch and told them of their master's machinations. Moloch, unaware of his brother's duplicity, devised the destruction of Mashkan Shapir at the hands of the Cainites, all while keeping his own role secret, or so he thought. Once Mashkan Shapir was wiped from the earth by the Lasombra, Nurgle's followers either dead or fled, Moloch became the leader of the Bali, and he wanted things nice and quiet. The sacrifices and the rites would continue, but they would be in secret. In one of Moloch's rare displays of heavy-handedness, he tortured and killed any Bali who balked at his rule. And as for the Dahabi, they were not only allowed to live, but to integrate themselves into the other Bali nests as a revenant family. As greater empires arose in Mesopotamia, occasionally one of the names of the children would come to be worshipped as a god in the ancient empires. This troubled Moloch, as these names were for him alone, and only to be used by him. After a few centuries of quiet, Nurgle's brood popped up again, this time calling themselves the Orphaned. Moloch allowed these orphaned to exist, and told himself that they would serve as decoys and distractions from his own more subtle practices. The cults of Pazuzu, Ariman, Baal, and Mat were rooted out and destroyed in their turns. Moloch contented himself that this was simply nature cleansing the weak. Yet, some of his own followers, powerful followers at that, began defecting to the orphaned, taking with them the names of power. This only got worse when Nurgle reemerged as Shaitan. What hand Moloch played in Shaitan Nurgle's destruction at Gnosis is unclear, but Nurgle's progeny believed that Moloch was responsible in some way. By 800 BC, Moloch tired of the Levant and the Middle East in general. With the orphans scattered and broken, he took his leave of the region and settled on the coast of North Africa in a city called Carthage. Now the Bruja, for all their caterwauling about Carthage, neglect to mention the influence or the importance of the Bali to their little project in human vampire coexistence. It was the Bali who recommended fortifying Hannibal Barca's war elephants with Vitae to ensure that they could cross the Alps into Rome. The clan of philosophers were easily led astray by the sophistry of the Bali. Trolley, the second Bruja antediluvian himself, or herself, the Bali believed Trolley was a fella, so that's what we'll be going with here. Trolley was led into depravity by Moloch, who had taken a single page from his brother Nurgle's playbook and set himself up in Carthage as Baal Haman, the chief god of the Phoenicians, and a connoisseur of child sacrifice. At first, Trolley despised the Bali and wanted them out of Carthage, but Moloch knew a little secret. Trolley's taste for diablerie did not end with his sire, Elias, the first Bruja antediluvian. Moloch encouraged Trolley to partake of Canite Vitae frequently. Eventually, Moloch became a fixture at Trolley's gruesome blood feasts, and the Bruja protests to the Bali's scarcely hidden organ pits in Carthage went silent. Eventually, Trolley came to witness the sacrifices himself, watching as the Bali butchered children and tossed their bodies into the mass of rotting flesh. Moloch once told his favorite child, Tanith, that he believed Trolley came to see if he had any shred of humanity left, and departed from the sacrifices, having learned the truth of himself. When the forces of Rome attacked Carthage for the final time in the Third Punic War, the Bali were shocked to see Moloch fighting at the side of Trolley against the Ventru, Malkavians, Toreador, and La Sombra. What they did not know and did not realize until the city was falling around them was that their master had joined with Trolley in the blood bond. The Bali abandoned Carthage and Moloch. The city was doomed, and Moloch had shown the worst sort of weakness possible for a Bali. He allowed another to hold power over him. Moloch and Trolley, twined in each other's arms, sank beneath the earth of Carthage. It was here that the Romans salted the destroyed city, a symbolic curse against those who had lived there and anyone else who might try to live there again. But the vampires laid a more potent curse on Carthage ensuring that Moloch and Trolley would never rise again. Number 7. 
Tanith. Tanith was the first and most beloved child of Moloch. During the period when Moloch opposed his brother Nurgle, his power base was in the city of Tyre, an ancient port on the coast of modern-day Lebanon. When the Bali ruled Tyre, Tanith was second only to her sire in her knowledge of the children of night and the secrets of the infernal. She went as far as to create a sect within the Bali known as the Keepers of Mystery, whose task was to acquire and hoard knowledge of the dark powers away from the hands of mortals. In 800 BC, Tanith became the undisputed ruler of Tyre when Moloch quit the city in favor of Carthage. Moloch insisted that she remain and rule the city in his name until he returned. In 332 BC, Tanith allowed the forces of Alexander the Great to sweep through Tyre and purge the city of non-Bali vampires and mortal opponents of her agenda. After Alexander's death, she re-emerged from the safety of her island haven and rebuilt Tyre in her own image as a city of mysteries. When Carthage fell, Tanith vowed that she would never permit the same thing that happened to her sire to occur in her domain. Since Carthage's fall, Tanith became the de facto leader of the Molakim, her sire's remaining progeny, and has ruled Tyre in secret through a series of puppets, including a brutal La Sombra corsair named Nicolau. In 1205 AD, Tanith received an unusual guest to her domain, the notorious Bali, Mary the Black. Tanith was perplexed as to how exactly to deal with Mary, whose psyche was damaged following her diablerie of the Toreador patriarch, Michael. Originally, she intended to manipulate Mary into a weapon to turn against her enemies. But in the 25 years Tanith gave Mary sanctuary, Tanith became oddly fond of her, insofar as a minion of hell can be fond of anyone. Tanith had not had a true peer in terms of knowledge or power since Moloch's departure for Carthage. In time, Tanith fell prey to that most common weakness of vampires, a desire for true companionship. Tanith took notice of a young Syrian girl named Shutatara, who was studious and had a faculty for languages. Unfortunately, Shutatara did not take well to being embraced, and could not acclimate to the strictures of the Bali. Shutatara fled from Tanith and took refuge in Cyprus. Tanith struck up a friendly, intellectual correspondence with the Prince of Cyprus, Nehemiah, with the goal of eventually convincing the Prince to return Shutatara to her. Tanith's fate in the modern nights is unknown. Number 6. Tanit Bal Sahar. Shutatara was not Tanith's first child. Sahar was born when Tyre was at the height of its wealth and power. As a young boy, he was dedicated to the Temple of Melkart as a praise singer to that god. In addition to song, Sahar had a gift for poetry that drew the attention of Tanith. Sahar's artistic talents were overshadowed by his questing and inquisitive mind. Tanith, as Moloch's child and a power in her own right, was accustomed to being regarded with a certain level of fear and reverence. But when she revealed herself to Sahar, he neither feared nor even worshipped her. In fact, he had the temerity to question her, for surely a god, as Tanith represented herself to be, must have the answers to all of the mysteries of creation. Tanith was, at first startled, then annoyed, then amused, and finally intrigued. She set aside the guise of divinity and indulged Sahar's curiosity on everything from history to philosophy to the occult to human nature. At last, Tanith offered Sahar an eternity to learn the answers to the questions that filled his soul. Sahar accepted Tanith's embrace and took on the name Tanit Bal in her honor. For several decades, Sahar absorbed all of the knowledge that Tyre had to offer him then asked Tanith to release him from her service so that he could wander the world. During Sahar's travels, he masqueraded as an itinerant bruja, and he observed mortals and canites alike, fascinated by the distinct cultures and religions of the ancient world, particularly religion. Despite his bruja guise, Sahar was still a Bali, and the symbols of faith caused him a great deal of discomfort. But he was like a moth to a flame dancing the halo of what could easily destroy him. Sahar spent centuries in the company of Bruja priests, Asamite mystics, and Zamitsi witches, seeking the nature of the divine. Sahar's travels took him to Carthage, the jewel of the Mediterranean and the home of his grandsire, Moloch. He took a break from his travels and began organizing his lengthy journals, notes, and musings into a coherent philosophy. 
He also compiled and eventually published several detailed travel logs that became popular in the ancient world. One of the admirers of his travel logs was none other than Camilla, the Ventru Prince of Rome. The two began a correspondence that resulted in Sahar relocating to Italy, where Sahar became the prince's companion. But Camilla's Spartan clanmate and advisor, Lysander, had no love for Brugia, and let's just say he would have likely reacted poorly if he knew what Sahar truly was. But Sahar was no advocate for Carthage or Moloch. In truth, he found the Canaanites of Carthage to be utterly dissolute and without merit, trading their immortal souls for temporal power. Sahar was also aware of the presence of his cousin in blood, Cybele. He knew that old grievances between the progeny of Nurgle and the progeny of Moloch had never healed and had no dealings with her. Sahar remained in Rome as his relationship with Camilla deepened into something beyond admiration and friendship. Inspired by Camilla's decadence and the indulgence of his own desires, Sahar penned his masterwork on hunger and its satisfaction and dedicated it to his friend, lover, and soulmate. On Hunger and Its Satisfaction would become the foundational text of a philosophy that spread amongst the Canaanites of Rome. Sahar's philosophy was the Via Desideratio, or as it became known to its enemies, the Via Peccati, the Road of Sin. To Sahar, the sinner had the right to live as freely as his will allowed, to be unbound by the laws of God, men, or Canaanites, and to embrace the beast as part of his own nature, not an enemy to be shackled or chained. When the Third Punic War broke out, Tanith urgently summoned Sahar back to Tyre. Though Sahar loathed the Molochim of Carthage, he was still loyal to his sire and took ship from Ostia. Before departing, Sahar promised Camilla that he would return as soon as he could. Sahar's ship disappeared on the journey, with no wreckage and no survivors. Tanith attempted to locate Sahar through sorcery, and Camilla dispatched agents to track him down. Yet, the only sign of Sahar was a handful of his working journals that turned up in a merchant's stall in Alexandria. Tanit Bal Sahar's final fate remains unknown. Number 5. Anazir Anazir was another of the Molakim who established a nest in the Near East and survived his sire's folly in Carthage. Anazir was embraced in the 12th century BC. Anazir's competence could not be questioned. His loyalty, on the other hand, well, he learned his lessons in secrecy from Moloch, but he was always an admirer of the power of Shaitan Nurgle and his citadel at Chorazin. Anazir counts himself as the first Bali in Damascus and the creator of its most prominent organ pit, the notorious Ibli al-Akbar. Anazir survived the turmoil of the region through malicious cunning. In the 7th century AD, the Bali had a cordial relationship with a few Asimites, who, despite being their ancient enemies, had fallen to the wilds of the demons dwelling in the city of Mecca. But the spread of Islam in Arabia saw a brief struggle within clan Asimite that ended with the rise to prominence of the Muslim Asimites and the capture and destruction of the infernal Asimites, but not before the rebellious Asimites confessed, under torture, to many secrets that the Bali would rather the children of Hakim had never learned. The United Asimites swept down on a dozen Bali nests, destroying them in less than a week. The Bali also lost control over the cities of Baghdad, Medina, Acre, and Sidon. Anazir, as a child of Moloch, used his prestige to summon five other Bali elders to Damascus to deal with the Asimite problem. The Bali captured two Asimite assassins and gathered 200 mortals for their ritual. Over the course of two months, Anazir and his allies sacrificed the mortals, feeding them each a drop of Asimite blood before hanging them upside down and flaying them alive slowly with weighted hooks attached to their flesh. The blood of the flayed victims was then distilled through alchemy and blessed by one of the Dakani. Anazir then force-fed the cursed blood to their Asimite captives and sacrificed them over the organ pit. Since the Asimites so greatly coveted the blood of the Bali, let them crave the blood of all other Canaanites as well. What had once been a ritual observance of the Asimites became an insatiable desire for Vitae and Diablerie. The Bali then concealed the Ibli al-Akbar from the sight of the Asimite sorcerers so that the curse might never be broken.
Number four, Sibylle. This is going to be a doozy. Sibylle is the name of one or possibly two vampires. One of the vampires discussed in the top ten vampires of Clan Malkavian was Petaniqua, or Olympias, whose sire was named Sibylle. Now there's nothing truly suspicious there on its face. It is entirely possible for two vampires to have the same name or to tap into the same mortal cult of the goddess Sibylle. The Bali Sibylle was a disciple of Shaitan Nurgle, tutored in the Infernal at the Gnosis Labyrinth with the rest of his dreaded progeny. Following the Bali War, Sibylle was one of the few Nurgleites to escape the doom of Mount Thera. Unlike her allies, she knew exactly who was responsible for Nurgle's downfall, his own brother, Moloch. Sibylle was popular with the Romans. Despite her cult of mendicant eunuchs, occasionally mutilating and castrating themselves in the streets. Sibylle's bloody practices, however, raised questions about her lineage, leading her to become isolated from Roman Canite society, and then to descend into even bloodier shows of debauchery, further isolation, and so on. Sibylle played an instrumental role in the fall of Carthage during the Third Punic War. It was her sorcery that sealed Moloch and Trolley beneath the earth, but she never returned to Rome. Instead, the last credible sighting of Sibylle placed her aboard a ship bound for Crete, home of the Bali Labyrinth and resting place of Namtaru. Nearly a millennium later, a rumor raced through the Bali ranks like wildfire. Sibylle had returned, appearing at the pit of Ibli al-Akbar near Damascus as a participant in the ritual to curse the Asimites. Those involved in the cursing of Hakim's blood report that Sibylle claimed to be one of the Dakani, a true demon, and servant of Namtaru. If indeed she found her way into the labyrinth and took one of the names of Namtaru, she might have truly become a demon lord in her own right. Now there is some confusion as to whether the Malkavian Sibylle and the Bali Sibylle are different or the same vampire. Now, the Bali have a unique practice to their bloodline called the Rite of Apostasy. Its creation and use are credited to Nurgle, who used it to corrupt and subvert vampires of other clans to the Bali cause, and required the Bali to nearly devour all of the target's blood and then feed it back to them. The vampire, then tainted with Bali blood in this ritualistic re-embrace, such as their signature discipline Daimonin, but an apostate is not a Bali, or at least not a pure Bali, and those embraced as Bali regard apostates as inferiors. Despite their change in loyalties and perhaps even blood, they may still pass as a member of their original clan. This brings us back to Sibylle. The story of Bali Sibylle does not contradict Malkavian Sibylle, at least until the third century BC, with the story of Olympias who would become Petaniqua. How could Sibylle be a Bali if Petaniqua is a Malkavian? It depends on how you interpret the rite of apostasy. The rite of apostasy may change the blood of a vampire, but does not wipe away their clan. If Sibylle were a Malkavian back on Crete and subjected to the rite of apostasy, her progeny, like Petaniqua, might still be Malkavian. And though Petaniqua never manifested Daimonian, her affiliation with the Black Spiral Dancers and the Worm lends credence to the theory that some taint remained in her blood. So why did the Malkavians go from hunting Sibylle in Greece to coexisting with her in Rome? Well, there's not a good explanation for this. The Roman Malkavians may not have held the same grievance against Sibylle that the Greek Malkavians did. Since the cult of Sibylle was a state-sponsored cult in the Roman Republic and then Empire, the Malkavians may have been afraid to make a move against her. And as an aside, if the rite of apostasy does function as I described before, then it's a support for the claim that Ur Shulgi, the current leader of Clan Asimite, may have been a Bali apostate, or still is one. Number three, Azanael. With the interment of Moloch and the disappearance of Nurgle, the Bali were left fractured and leaderless. Enter Azanael, the leader of the new Bali movement, well, new for the Dark Ages. Azanael is the heir of Shaitan Nurgle, and while he did not possess his forebear's natural charisma, he more than compensated with sheer force of will. And it is that force of will that Azanael used to gather his Bali followers to him, 
on the assumption that he meant to usurp the remaining elders of the Bali and seize control of the bloodline. But Azanael's true goal was always Chorazin, specifically the lower city of Chorazin. Azanael believed that Chorazin was not an end to itself, but a gate through which eternal darkness could seep into the world. Unfortunately, he was not Shaitan's equal. He did not know how to complete Chorazin and open the door to the Children of Night. Azanael believed that he required the body of Namtaru, concealed within the labyrinth beneath Gnosis, but none of the agents he sent to Crete ever returned. Azanael believed that one or more of the Dakani guarded Namtaru's sleeping form. If it was one of the demon lords, then Azanael lacked the power to fight them. While Crete remained impassable to Azanael, he focused on uniting the European Bali beneath his banner. With enough Bali, he reasoned, his chances of conquering the labyrinth and returning Namtaru to Chorazin would improve. In the 11th century AD, Azanael discovered a text claiming that the lower city was concealed behind a barrier of living shadows. When one deals with living shadows, it's best to call on experts. To that end, Azanael recruited a coven of Valencian La Sombra infernalists known as the Angelus Ater, the Black Angels. Nurgle indeed hid the gate to the lower city behind a wall of shadow, and the Angelus Ater succeeded in opening the lower city. But Nurgle was as paranoid as anyone, and set wards throughout the lower city that killed many La Sombra in Bali. Finally, Azanael and company reached the pit where Namtaru originally slept since it was cast down by the first light. Namtaru, in its fitful sleep, thrashed, etching words and symbols of power into the walls of the pit, words so powerful that they did not even wait to be read. The words simply leapt into the minds and souls of Azanael's company, shattering them like stones thrown against weak glass. The infernal vampires, in a maddened frenzy, fell on each other, howling for blood, each desiring to be the sole inheritor of the true power of Chorazin. And from the gates of the lower city, only Azanael emerged, and he was greatly changed. His eyes had become thereafter solid black, and his soul was a lightless pit from which nothing in creation would escape. Azanael made his nest in the upper city and embraced a brood loyal only to him, the Azanaeli. Thankfully, only Azanael can create progeny in this manner. Whatever Chorazin did to his blood, it rendered all of his childers sterile and unable to sire. This suits Azanael just well. Azanael demanded that the Bali unite beneath his rule as the master of Chorazin. Younger Bali flocked to him, while the elders of the blood ignored him. Azanael responded by declaring war against his own kind, a war that continued throughout the Dark Ages. Number 2. Anson. Anson was born in the 9th century in England, the son of a landed knight. He was trained at arms and enjoyed a relatively easy life for the time. But when Pope Urban II called for a crusade to retake the Holy Land, Anson, as a man of 20, was far better suited for the war than his aging father. He was loath to leave his quiet, predictable life behind, but as a knight in his own right, he dare not refuse the call of Deus Volt. Anson was baptized in the blood of Saracens and infidels, and was thereby reborn. He found that he craved violence, plunder, rapine, and slaughter. Any qualms he had about becoming a holy terror were covered by the offer of remission of sins for those who died in the Crusades. Though, Anson had absolutely no intention whatsoever of dying for the sake of Christendom, or anything else for that matter. In fact, it seemed that Anson was two men. His normally calm, carefree manner contradicted the barbarity that he visited on warriors and civilians alike. When the Crusaders captured Jerusalem in 1099 AD, Anson's viciousness caught the attention of the local Bali, who subdued and embraced him. Anson awakened in the organ pit with a mixture of terror and fascination at his new state. Vampirism was beyond his imagination as a mortal, and the ways of the Bali even further beyond. Yet, he appreciated the power of corruption and perversion. Immortality had only worsened Anson's sadism. Plundering wealth and violating women had given way to plundering and violating human souls. Yet, his entree into the secret world of vampires and demons gnawed at his sanity for how little he truly knew of the world. 
he became obsessed with secrets and power. By 1680, Anson had fallen under the sway of the Carpathian demon, Kupala, and gained access to the Cathedral of Flesh from his patron. In the interest of freeing Kupala, Anson brought about the death of Maria Asuncion, the last Cappadocian in Transylvania, beheading her before she could be diablerized by Ambrogino Giovanni. With that shackle loosened from the demon, Anson returned to the Cathedral of Flesh. But demons make for poor allies and worse masters. Eventually, Kupala saw Anson as having outlived his usefulness and commanded the cathedral to devour Anson, the same fate that befell the cathedral's creator, the Zemitsi Methuselah, Yorak. Number 1. Mary the Black Even a lineage as obsessed with secrecy and depravity as the Bali has its own legends and villains. Mary the Black happens to be both. Born over two millennia before the birth of Christ, Mary the Black was born Marie in the city of Ebla, the daughter of a powerful Lugal, or ward boss of that ancient city. When the Toreador antediluvian embraced Mikael, Marie became one of the Toreador god king's first worshippers, believing with all of her heart in the truth of his divinity. Marie became Mikael's most loyal disciple and eventually his lover. Mikael gave her his blood, preserving her beauty long after her mortal lifespan, and taught her to write, as he had been a scribe while he was mortal himself. Yet, forces more powerful than a god-king moved against Ebla. The Akkadians struck the city in a tidal wave of death. Mikael was driven from the city, and Mari was left alone, trapped, as the invaders battered down the walls to put the city to the torch. Mari spent her remaining days etching her story of her long life on a set of clay tablets. She also wrote her bitter fury at the betrayal she had suffered at the hands of her so-called love and God. When the last character was etched, Mari set aside her stylus and took up Mikhail's sword, running it through her own belly, spilling her blood out over the tablets. Mari's testament baked in the heat of the burning city, sealing the words and the powerful curse of her hatred within the clay for all time. In the 18th century BC, scavengers unearthed the tablets of Mari and scattered them throughout the known world. In the town of Ugrit, on the northern coast of Syria, one of the tablets came into the possession of a scribe who was literate in Eblite. This scribe was also a servant of the Bali priest named Anaduk the Black, and recognized in the writing certain characteristics resembling a ghoul's existence. The scribe brought the tablets to his master, who used auspects to glean not only the memories, but the emotions burned into the clay. The Bali felt Marie's emotions, her passion, her hatred, her fear, and her love. At that moment, Anaduk the Black desired Marie for his own, as he had never desired anything before. In the world of darkness, a world of mysteries and monsters, bringing someone back from the dead, and I mean, all the way dead, not vampire undead, I mean dead, buried, in the ground, and turned to ash, that is not something that happens very often. The Shem's Heru can do it using the spell of life. Certain powerful archmages can pull it off. A few wraiths can re-inhabit their old bodies in a semblance of life. The Quasian are, well, they're kind of alive, depending on whatever dharma they follow and some demons can pull it off, though not for very long. But Anaduk the Black was none of these things. He was a vampire, and a Bali to boot, and his resources in this task were mostly demonic. So he summoned his master, Anaster, one of the Dakani, to make the only bargain that powerful demons are interested in. Anaduk bartered the last bits of his soul in exchange for Anaster resurrecting Mari, but Anoster is a demon of plague. Resurrecting the dead, at least in the way Anaduk wanted, was neither in his purview nor at his level of power to go scouring the underworld for the soul of a woman centuries dead, find her a spare body in acceptable condition somewhere, and then plug the aforementioned soul into said body. No, for the demon lord, there was a much simpler solution to this problem. Anoster delivered Anaduk a succubus with a unique ability to subsume the tablets and become whatever was contained within them. Now, unless your name is John Constantine, selling your soul to a demon is never going to work out well for you. 
and since Anaduk had only a few of the tablets in his possession, he was only able to partially reconstruct Mari. And what he got was, well, a hate-filled, charred succubus who slew the Bali priest and devoured his blood, becoming a Bali vampire herself. In the century since, Mari, or Mary the Black as she came to be known, spent most of her time hunting down the remaining tablets to absorb and complete her transformation. By the 13th century, Mary had located all of the tablets and become whole, and with every tablet she found, her hatred grew stronger for her former patron, her lover, and her god, Mikhail, or Michael as he called himself after his Christian baptism. Mary made her nest in the House of Lamps in Constantinople, run by Leila Madier, a Nefandis mage and worshipper of Anaster. Mary's other confederate was a deranged La Sombra named Peter the Humble, who fully believed Michael to be an archangel, and that Mary the Black was the foe worthy to combat his lord and permit him to ascend to his proper place at God's side. In 1204 AD, as Constantinople burned and Michael's haven beneath the Hagia Sophia was sufficiently desecrated that a Bali could enter it, Peter led Michael through the carnage to confront the Toreador patriarch, Michael. Hmm. Peter, Mary, and Michael meeting in a church dedicated to Jesus. Mary raged at Michael, cursed him, and vented three millennia of fury at the vampire who had betrayed her so long ago. Michael offered no apology. He only said that he had never wished to hurt her, and that everything he had done was necessary to secure the future that lay before him, and that if Mary was not so driven to destroy him, he could not ascend. This did not help matters. With Michael's own sword, Mary cut down Peter the Humble and then Michael. The Toreador Methuselah lay helpless as Mary sank her fangs deep into his pale flesh and drank. In the eating of his flesh and the drinking of his blood, very biblical, she learned the truth. Michael had not betrayed her, and he did not wish to leave her in Ebla, but was compelled by a will greater than his own, and that he spent years grieving for Marie, even as Michael's powerful blood filled Mary's body. Her vengeance, the driving force for her existence for so long, tasted like bitter ashes. All of her hatred turned to self-loathing. Her self-justifications rang hollow in her ears. She fled from Constantinople, her mind and spirit shattered, but the tale of her deed followed her. To those who remained loyal to Michael in his dream, Mary the Black was the most loathsome creature to ever exist. Mary sought sanctuary in the city of Tyre, home to her fellow Bali, Tanith, who gently and carefully brought her back from the brink of self-destruction. Mary was a powerful and dangerous instrument of the Infernal, one whom Tanith initially wanted to test against the troublesome Saluri warrior Kawiel Haduba, the Lioness of Jerusalem. By the 18th century, Mary the Black returned to herself and her origins as a demon. She usurped Anoster and took his place among the Dakani as a demon lord. And those were the top 10 vampires of the Bali. My opinion on the Bali is split. They were an interesting idea, but they don't really do anything that can't be done by another clan or group or sect of vampires, and they aren't really integral to the setting in the same way that the Black Spiral Dancers are to Werewolf or the Nefandi are to Mage. The Bali are kind of superfluous to vampire, or let me put it like this. If you are a puppy-kicking, baby-eating Satan worshiper, and you are not the big bad of the setting or the game, there needs to be a very good reason as to why, and it's kind of hard to escalate villainy past said puppy kicking and baby eating. Now, the revised Bali lore gives decent explanations as to why. The Bali tend to mostly avoid other vampires, and they are too busy fighting each other over whether or not to unleash the lords of darkness, plague, and destruction. Like the Salubri, I think the Bali would have worked better as a separate sect as opposed to a clan or a bloodline. I'll freely admit that I'm a masquerade diehard, but I will give Requiem the credit that it's due. That line did a good job moving away from the Camarilla Sabat Cold War Tango to a setting with multiple important factions, differing philosophies, contrary goals straight out of the box, or toolkit rather. So this is the end, the very last of the top 10 vampire videos. I hope you've enjoyed listening because I've enjoyed making them. Now, 
I have more lore explorations and commentaries waiting to be made, but you'll have to wait to find out what those are. Until next time.